introduce Brendan Lynch, an artist with the Stillhouse Group. Jack McCullough and Lazaro Hernandez, the designers and founders of Perenza Schuler, and Dan Porter, the head of digital for William Morris Endeavor, which, as you may know, bought IMG last year and now is in possession of quite a number of fashion weeks around the world. Uh, I'm going to ask each of them to talk a little bit about their somewhat unique uh, relationship with social media, but before I do that, we're going to start with a, um, a special message from someone who has really defined a new frontier for um, what social media means and how it's used. Ladies and gentlemen, Ai Weiwei. I think our time is going to be defined by internet. Uh, since we have the internet, I think the humanity and the whole structure of society has changed. Along the tech, uh, technology, the way we understand the world, the way we communicate with each other and uh, to, to receive information and uh, to get our message, uh, reach another person, and uh, in the larger scale, our politics, global politics, local politics. So that uh, make me to be aware with uh, social media. And uh, this is uh, the best gift uh, from our long time human struggle. Uh, in the reality, every day I spend the most time uh, on social media and to learn and to, to, to help me to learn and to think and to communicate, to reach out. So the only because the social media it can put me into a position which I would have confidence to still practice my work and uh, to, to have the confidence and the knowledge to act as a, a contemporary individual. So that in, has a very profound meaning in my practice, not only through communication but the new expression and how to structure our work and how to uh, express yourself and uh, to reach out to, to try and to um, involve people with the same kind of emotion and the same kind of understanding. When Sichuan had an earthquake, 5,000 students disappeared in the earthquake. So we, we use the social media to ask questions and to, to really organize the volunteers to, to build up some kind of investigation and research and which achieved a very, uh, very unbelievable uh, result and uh, which made us more understand uh, about uh, our situation also made the whole society to be conscious about the power of the social media. After my arrest, uh, we raised the conscious about uh, uh, how to fight through the legal system, and we got a very broad, uh, very broad support from the people who who would lend us money. They said we use that as our voting ticket to tell the government um, we are on your side and we are supporting you. Outside the studio of one of China's most famous artists, citizens like Zhang Xiaoyu are taking part in what they see as an act of defiance against the Chinese government. She is donating a few dollars to dissident artist Ai Weiwei, an outspoken government critic recently slapped with a $2.4 million bill for alleged tax evasion. So 30,000 people within one week raised 9 million Chinese yuan, and which is unbelievable. It would never happen if without social media, and it's like a miracle. So that proved to the government they're wrong, and they shouldn't do the things like that. The last thing I would say is, social media for artists is the best way to to really reach out 
and also it's a challenge. It's a challenge how we put the classic sense of uh, you know aesthetic values, you know the the kind of skill, the kind of understanding, and how to transform our emotions into a more uh, uh, through this kind of technology, through this kind of digital and uh, cyber space, and uh, to 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 reach another end, which is a human being sitting in the other end who will receive the information. I think that is a miracle. Okay. <laughs> Brendan, what are your feelings about that? <laughs> is it a miracle? Has it been a miracle for you? Why don't you talk a bit about um, what you do with Tumblr, mostly? Um, well, or Instagram. I, I feel like he's using it in, in a very different way than than I'm using it. He's kind of using it to get his message out, and so people can kind of follow along with what he's doing. Where I was kind of interacting with Instagram as sort of this other space to like exhibit artwork and and not just a, like another sort of realm and another sort of context where, where something can exist and I ideas can exist. And uh, so for the, the show I did, do we have pictures? Do I push this? Yeah, pictures. So this is from a project I did in Paris at Bugatta and Cargnell in, in April. And I did this whole show that was based around this one character who's this New York sort of it girl, socialite kind of figure, sort of like a, t a tastemaker in a way. And I was interested in kind of interacting with her and as a way of sort of removing my own sort of aesthetic sensibilities and using hers to create kind of different objects and forms and paintings. And uh, part of the show was this Instagram account that I created that was kind of mirroring hers in terms of like numbers and followers. So it says I have. 52,000 followers, but it's all just this illusion. All the followers were bought, all the comments were bought, all the likes were bought. Mm -hmm. And it kind of presented this, uh, I don't know, this idea of like popularity or this illusion of popularity and kind of how that number kind of dictates how you look at the rest of the imagery that, that sort of follows. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of my interaction with it. It wasn't using Instagram as a way of like promoting myself or I don't know, kind of like my, my real life. It was sort of this, this kind of like made up, made up uh, reality. So was it a comment on what you, you saw as the way other people relate to Instagram or the way the role Instagram plays in culture? Yeah, I just, I, I liked how it's the same kind of platform for everyone, but depending on who's using it, it kind of has a, I don't know, a different meaning or a different kind of importance. Um, and why did you pick Instagram? Because that was sort of a lot of the research I did for the show was like using Instagram by like looking at hers and it, it kind of gives a lot of information, you know, and a lot of these kind of, I don't know, points of interest that I could pull from and all these sort of uh, ideas and decisions that other people were making that I could kind of turn into, into my own work. Um, <coughs> Is it, a, is it a platform that most of your peers use? Yeah, I think a, a lot of people use it. I kind of I stay off it. I feel like I'm, I'm sort of bad at, at social media because it, it depends so much on this uh, kind of instant response. You know, if you like see something and you comment on it immediately, and, and for me, it's my first responses aren't always the best, so I, it was kind of dangerous to me, so when I approached using Instagram, I kind of had to do it with this really specific idea in mind and set sort of boundaries for myself, like mm -hmm. not allowing myself to comment on anyone because I didn't want that like first response yeah. to be sort of like set in, in stone or, mm -hmm. um, and then I have some, uh, so this was, this was from it, and this was one of the sculptures I, I had in the show. So the last kind of post I put on the Instagram were images from the show and, uh, I sort of treated it the way these, these kind of it girls do where they, I feel like companies will, you know, they give them a product and then they post a picture of themselves wearing it and they add all the different designers and it kind of like fuels itself. So like with, with these sculptures, I mm -hmm. use these different items that were selected from this, this girl's website. She like lays out all these different 
like things that she likes, and I went through and picked all these different kind of objects, and then made these sculptures with them. Do you have any Paranza Schuller? No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. This is a uh, uh. Anna Karen Carlson of the sunglasses and a, <laughs> and a Christopher Kane dress. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. Don't mention it. <laughs> um, okay. I think we're gonna. Just move on. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Jack and Lazaro, do you want to talk about how you use Instagram, Tumblr? What's your um, what's your poison? <laughs> Um, it's interesting. I mean, for us, we're not the biggest Instagram social media users on a personal level, but we're fascinated by it, um, and I guess on a creative level. Um, it's really interesting how Instagram and social media has come to sort of, you know, define the aesthetics of, of the moment. Um, the dawn of social media really sort of instigated a whole new aesthetic, really. Um, and you know, as a fashion designer, we're really drawn to like you know what's what the now is all about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us, social media is like or Instagram. It's like a modern day collage in a way. Mm -hmm. It's sort of an evolution of that really traditional form. Um, it's all these sort of contradicting, juxtaposed images all sort of jumbled together. Um, to create like a, a mood, a vibe uh, that, you know, that defines something, that means something. Um, and like when you're kind of going through Instagram, all these random images all st strewn together, sort of they come to define that very specific moment in time that you yourself have curated mm -hmm. and that no two Instagrams are the same. So you have your own little collage mm -hmm. that defines that moment in time and you actually use pictures in your textiles. Yes, no. Yeah, we did a whole collection based on that. Yeah, that's this, uh, this season that they're showing slides of. And uh, that season in particular, we were really kind of, I think that's kind of when Instagram first made an impact on us. And like Lazaro was saying, uh, people are curating their own kind of images, these collages themselves, but also when you're just scrolling through your feed, uh, you're getting just this mixture of completely random images of everyone else's different curated images, which in a way is very, like, very much a sign of the times in this weird way for us. We were very interested in the, just the randomness of it all, and so we started pulling images off the, the internet that kind of reflected this, this feeling that we were getting off of that. So you were just sitting at your computer, streaming through images? Yeah, people were asking us like, what these images meant, and they didn't mean anything. The, their randomness was sort of the point. Um, we were kind of getting really into digital printing. It was at a time when digital printing was becoming like, you know, very an, an available thing. Um, and we were kind of really interested in pursuing that, but we weren't sure like what kind of images to, to put or if to make it like one world or one theme or one vibe. Um, and we decided at the end to sort of just kind of go, you know, kind of crazy and just use all kinds of images that had nothing to do with each other. And that randomness, that that, that nothing means anything, mm -hmm. that, that somehow was more sort of, that felt more right to us. Mm -hmm. It felt more like today. Mm -hmm. um, just this sort of, all this information. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was just really, a really interesting process for us. And it was kind of a strange collection for us as well, because at the same time, we're very analog. We're not yeah. very computer driven. I mean, we're fascinated by technology, especially more on a textiles level. and. Mm -hmm. In, in terms of what we create, but uh, we still just hand draw everything and the, we're, we're very analog in that way. So to kind of bring this element into things is kind of a bit of a shock for us and a bit of a challenge. Something uh, um, also about social media is how we're presenting our collections these days. We were talking about that before the other day with you, um, how people are experiencing shows now via their phones and via the, I mean, via the internet first, but now, like, I just look at collections now through my phone, I just swipe through looks. And you're like judging an entire body of work, six months worth of work, um, you know, the image is like three inches by one inch, and you're oh, like, oh, that show sucked, or that show was great. <laughs> and you're making these judgments yeah. based on nothing, really. So the way we've sort of approached designing collections has changed, really. You know, yeah, I think, I think most of the industry We're going to come back to that. I want to go okay. to Dan, though, talking of shows and how you deal with shows and social media. What's um, the William Morris story? Um, so I would say on the panel, I'm probably 
the highly tactical person, uh, meaning I look at all of this primarily from a business perspective uh, and also engage digitally. So you're right, I mean, obviously it's changed the nature of what a fashion show is. Uh, but I think you're gonna see the shows change with that. And so we look at it from a couple ways. One is you have the opportunity to create a tremendous amount of media around that show. I don't know if you have, a, I have like a 45 second clip um, of stuff. We had literally 10 people on site creating all types of content within 120 seconds of when it went down the runway. And it wasn't just photos. It was photos, it was stories, it was backstage. Um, and a lot of the interesting thing that happens in social is actually driven by sports. And when you talk to uh, Twitter and Facebook and these people about sports and then subsequently about fashion, the thing that they want, and I use this as an analogy, is they don't necessarily want the highlights you know, for their end users. What they want is, is they describe it as that when the players run through the tunnel, that part that you can't see, that you could never see before, and now you're privy to seeing. And so when we get to the shows and we're backstage and we're seeing people being made up and we're seeing all the stuff that's pinned on the walls, you're creating so much of a bigger picture for the end user uh, that it really, it brings it alive. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can play that. Do we have a clip? Or not. <laughs> Seeing that, I mean, that was all made by basically 22-year-old kids on their iPhones. They slowed it up, they sped it down, they took you on the runway, they took you behind the runway. And that, I think, you know, as a first step is, is really key. I think the next step is you come to a show and all the Instagrammable moments, if you want to call them that, are on the runway. And how do we innovate the show so that there are moments throughout the whole experience that not only these kids who are producing this can do, but anybody attending the show can participate in it as well. I'm just, I'm struck by the fact that every single one of you talked about Instagram. Is that like hands down the social media platform you think is most interesting or most useful? It's the most visual for me. It's just, it's yeah. kind of the easiest to access as well. I mean, it's just kind of, yeah. it's, it's, it can be mindless at the same time as well, which I think people are drawn to at times. Yeah. I mean, does it leave the most open for your own interpretation? Definitely. Brandon? I don't know. It, just, it seems to be the most, the most popular one and the most kind of uh, diverse one. Like all the, all the other ones, like Tumblr, it seems to be kind of really specific just with like what they're talking about, just this kind of like random stream of imagery. But when you see with Instagrams, there's all these different ways that people are handling it, handling it. You know, like there's ones that are just like random streams of imagery or just like everyday life or for like business where like other ones seem to kind of have specific mm -hmm. functions. And has it sent you off in sort of in creative directions you didn't think you would go before? You know, has it, has it made you, for example, Jack and Lazarus, more willing to sort of dereference imagery? You know, traditionally fashion designers went off and they went on their trips and they went to India and they saw saffron and they came back and they made a saffron collection. <laughs> it was all in India and that was great. Um, you know, but this is something else entirely. You know, this is a really sort of decontextualized work. And what does that mean? We go back and forth between embracing it and completely rejecting it. Um, like after that Tumblr collection, we did like, I guess it's called the Trump Lloyd collection, we call it, where we knew that what you were seeing on the screen was one thing, but actually it was something completely different. Like everyone thought it was like a very Tweety collection, um, and the collection was actually made of leather. So we had woven all these sort of leathers to look like tweed. So we were kind of like playing with that, playing with the idea of like you think you know what you're seeing when you're seeing it from an image, but then you have to actually experience the traditional 
relationship with clothes, which is wearing them and touching them and the tactile nature of things, mm -hmm. you were sort of forced to go back and interact with the clothes to really experience what the clothes were about. Because what the, the message we we're telling you via image was completely different. We're sort of lying to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so we like kind of that back and forth, playing with mm -hmm. those sort of perceptions and expectations. Because mm -hmm. um, people think they, they know what they're looking at a lot of the time via all these social media channels. Um, a lot of the time, it's, it's not the truth at all. It's just a fabrication. Fabrication. There you go. <laughs> so we play a lot with that. With, you know, we think a lot about have you that. Ever, have you ever reviewed a show just by look going online and looking at images? Or? No. No. <laughs> yeah. It's a you completely different it's experience. Like, but I people, wouldn't do that. People have. Um, and that's always so odd. Yeah. No, how, um, and Dan, has it like, changed some of your um, thinking vis-a-vis -vis William Morris's other businesses in terms of what's happening with fashion and social media? Um, I mean, certainly if you look at the traditional talent business, there's an, a meteoric rise of what we'll call digital talent, you know, people who have 10 times the audience of traditional talent. And what you learn from working with those people, and, you know, that's a more sophisticated way of saying YouTubers and people like that, is, is kind of, is twofold. Number one is that they actually own their audience. They are both the content and the distribution network at the same time. And that's incredibly powerful. I've seen people we represent uh, generate three times more tweets on Twitter than Game 7 of the World Series represented. And so if you can own that audience and communicate with them directly, you can get them to do a lot. But what you really learn from working with those folks is that what drives a lot of the growth, both for brands and for talent, is authenticity. And you know, the most kind of you know, atomic example is some of the most popular people are people who sit in their bedrooms and talk to their fans. And, and fashion is a category and beauty is a gigantic category uh, on YouTube and somewhat on Vine. And it's because those people are, they feel known to them. They feel very authentic. And I think the brands that tap into that uh, and are, are able to do well and the ones who kind of hold back use the medium just like it's another page in a magazine, and I think that that's, you know, hopefully that they will, they will change that over time. Okay, so if authenticity is so important, um, how is your totally inauthentic Instagram show received? <laughs> um, some people were upset about it, but what was kind of interesting was when I, when I made the, f the fake account, I, I kind of assumed that, or I thought that people would know that it was fake, and it was kind of some humor in it, but People how that, would they know it was fake? Because well, how would I have, you know, 52,000 followers? That's like, seems like an unattainable amount. But. <laughs> people seem very credulous about that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. Um, but I noticed people who weren't in my immediate friend group were kind of taking it as truth. And when they would come up to me and talk to me, like, oh, like, you're, you're killing it now. Like, you have, like, all these followers. And, like, I felt like people were kind of treating me differently because of this, this like number or like people who haven't seen me in years like would contact me and be like, you know, like interested in like why I have this amount and they, they like didn't question it, you know, which I thought, which I thought was kind of interesting. And then did you use that in your show? Um, no, the, the, it was just like a link to the, the account, like it was just sort of, the show was just kind of existing in these, these two different realms, mm -hmm. like one in the gallery and one on on this like Instagram page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was there any backlash or um, response to your Tumblr collection back I in Lazarus? I feel like it was pretty well, it was well received. I mean, for us, it was like a, a big change from the season we had done before. Uh, we're, we're pretty flippant in that way. Every season we kind of approach things in a very different way and can sometimes aesthetically feel very different. And that I think was a big transition for us uh, and, and it was well received. I think some people were a bit conf confused by it or maybe felt it was a bit concept. Mm -hmm. uh, but we always like it when we kind of get a mixed reaction from a collection and mm -hmm. it, that it's not all glowing reviews and that there's like a little bit of tension there. I mean, that's mm -hmm. interesting to us. Mm -hmm. What are the risks involved with this kind of um, you know, creative process? Can, can it sort of take you off in really strange directions because it isn't you know, natural or organic maybe to you? What do you think? Dan, what do you think? Um, 
I think that people want to, people don't necessarily, and I'll, I'll speak for kind of a more narrow millennial generation of consumers and, and slightly above, they don't just want to consume, right? They want to participate. And so this idea that social enables you through anything from the comments to seeing how a product is made to seeing all those other things like that, you feel like when you consume that product, you're consuming a larger experience. So in the best examples, uh, it, it supports that and allows people to have deeper relationships. You know, but it's important to, set, to, to distinguish kind of your personal sharing from your sharing and consuming of, of brand. My personal sharing is I'm taking a picture uh, in front of a thing that says the New York Times International Luxury Conference. Really what I'm saying on Instagram is I'm saying you guys are freezing your ass off in New York and I'm in Florida <laughs> on stage with Vanessa Friedman. Ha ha to you. So, uh, and, but that's not, the same, that's not the same thing that brands need to say. You know, they're not focused on the FOMO or fear of missing out. They're focused, in fact, on the opposite, which is bringing you in. And I think really unlocking that um, can do a lot of things. And then seeing, in turn, how people wear and consume their products. Many of the brands I know spend an enormous amount of time searching the hashtags, looking at how people are using these, looking at how people are representing themselves using these things. And I think that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you did your Tumblr collection, did anyone say, hey, that's my picture? What's it doing on your dress? Um, we've had some issues like that, yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I, I believe we bought the rights. Yeah, we bought the all those for that collection. Rights. We did. Yeah. yeah. I people, mean, we weren't directly pulling images off Tumblr. We were kind of uh, we, we found images uh, uh -huh. on all sorts of different websites, and then you have to contact the people, and because yeah. people come after you <laughs> when you least expect it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> So having done this now, Brendan, having done this once, I mean, is it the kind of, like, did it open up other ideas for you? Did it lead you in other directions? Um, or do you feel like you're done with it? You're going to run away. I don't <laughs> Close <know>. that door. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I definitely took a break from it after this show, but I, what, what I kind of learned from it is how I want things to exist on these multiple platforms. So for every kind of show that I do, after that one, it's I want to create all these different spaces so there's not, it's not just one thing existing in one space and one time. It's like kind of what they were saying about, you know, seeing a fashion line on, you know, just on your phone or seeing it in real life and how, how different that is. And I kind of feel it's, I don't think one's better or one's worse or one's good or bad. It's just, it, it's kind of just how it is now. And so how do I like interact with this or play with this? Mm -hmm. And Jack and Lazarus, you, you went there, you went somewhere else, you're going to go back? I mean, we're always kind of going back and forth. What we're interested in right now is like sort of exploring something that feels more personal. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was our natural reaction to reject that right after we did it. But now we're trying to find like the happy medium where we create something that's sort of Instagrammable, where it has like that immediate punch, but also like not sacrificing the, the end use and the reality of fashion, which is clothing to be worn. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to find that middle ground. We can't completely reject that because that's just the reality of the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't reject the fact that clothes have to be worn and that they feel good against the body and that they have to fit, and that they can be these outlandish things. Um, you know, and as a young brand, it gets the whole Instagram thing, for example, gets sort of difficult when you're competing against like Chanel's and Louis Vuitton's of the world that are creating these huge spectacles that cost, you know, tens of millions of dollars four times a year. And they're creating these huge things. So as a young brand, you have to sort of think outside the box and how do you, you can't compete against that. Mm -hmm. So what do you do that's different than that? How do you create a different experience? You can't compete with, you know, the Cara de Levines and Karl Lagerfeld doing like a, a song and dance with Pharrell. You can't, you can't compete against that. So what do you do to get attention? Mm -hmm. Or, and, you know, and it's sort of what we do is something a little more intimate. We've sort of gone the opposite direction and, and sort of speak to the, to the woman a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, in hopes that she sort of talks to her friends and it becomes more of a word of mouth thing. Mm -hmm. um, and until we're ready to create this spectacle, we need to sort of explore alternative mm -hmm. ways of communicating. Mm -hmm. And Dan, how do you create those Instagrammable moments in a show? Um, well, certainly. What is an Instagrammable moment? <laughs> well, do you define that? You know, I, I, when, when, we, when we always are strategizing about uh, 
Fashion Week, for example, uh, I'll bring up an exa a different example of Burning Man, let's say, and you can consume Burning Man where these people are in the desert wearing crazy costumes and there's an infinite number of Instagrammable moments. You in front of something else, you standing next to somebody versus only one you know, photo you can take which is on the runway. Uh, so it's making it more interactive for the people who attend, but I'm actually also doing a lot of work in virtual reality. And so, uh, you know, all of the, the talks this morning talking about, you know, creating new types of textiles and, and, and manufacturing in different ways. Uh, we're gonna have opportunities where you're gonna strap on, you know, a headset that looks less and less like a sci-fi headset and more like you're slotting your phone. And you are gonna be in a 3D immersive reality looking at how these products are being made and experiencing them in a totally different way. And uh, I know, Brandon, you probably don't want to hear that it's going to get more immersive and everything else like that. But I think it's really going to continue to open up and, and shrink that divide between the consumer and the brands they consume. I have to say, I think sliding your phone into your glasses still sounds a little bit sci-fi to me. But <laughs> Considering the, old school. <laughs> the giant headsets. A little stressful. Uh, it's, it's come you a could long design way. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we have about five minutes for questions from the audience. We do have a microphone walking around, so people should feel free to stand up and um, ask. Anybody? Come on. Yes. Does someone have a microphone? Sorry, it's coming too. Um, I'm wondering if and how Instagram and social media changes the definition of luxury for people who are sort of in the business of defining it. I guess it's, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think luxury has always been a very elite thing. Um, and I guess the, traditionally fashion has been about like keeping everyone out and letting the elite people in to create a sort of desire. And I think social media has broken all those parameters down. Now the opposite seems to be true, where you want to invite everyone in. Um, I guess what's tricky is that as a luxury company, the products aren't for everyone. So you're trying to speak to everyone, but you don't have something to sell to everyone. So there's a sort of there's a little dichotomy in that um, that we're still trying to figure out. Because yeah, everyone wants to have the most followers and talk to the most people but we don't have things to sell to everyone. It's a very sort of niche market. Mm. So I guess it's about targeting who you're speaking to a little bit more specifically. Mm -hmm. um, like more is definitely not, is not always better in the luxury market maybe mm. we're finding. And Brendan, what do you think? I mean, art is clearly a very luxury object. Um, what has it done anything to you to be able to talk to so many people or expose your work to so many people? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know that. I think like for social media and, and art, it's it's kind of what he was saying about just accessibility and not having it be just this really kind of specific thing that only certain people are invited to or allowed to go. It's it's kind of opened it up to where everyone can can be a part of it. And like what Dan was saying about making this sort of like 360 experience and not just like. I don't know, one photo or, or one angle or something. Mm -hmm. But that certainly doesn't obviate the fact that it can still be a luxury object. I mean, allowing people to experience it and own it are different, different things. Yes. Yeah, I think, well, with art, it's, it's, a, it's only a luxury object if you're, if you're collecting, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of supposed to be for everyone as, as a viewer. Uh -huh. So I guess it plays in, in two different realms. Yes, Angela? When you say it was part of your show, oh, sorry, <laughs> that it was part of your show, how did it relate to your show? Was your show, I'm sorry, I don't know you as an artist, <laughs> was your show a show of what? What kind of work do you do? Um, we had, I had some images up, but uh, the show was sculptures. Sorry, and, I came in late, so it's yeah. okay. The, the show was uh, sculptures and paintings, and all the objects used in the sculptures were taken from this uh, young woman's website where she lays out all these different, all these different objects that she likes. And but you made up. 
What? But you made no, no. This the objects were taken from her website. So I like went through her website and picked out different things that I liked and bought them. And then. So this is the it girl. Yeah, yeah. And then the Instagram account was just a another way of sort of interacting with this character. Like so, it was in objects and both in. So the sculptures were the things like the garment rack and. Yeah, yeah. So the whole there was an irony throughout. In other words, or yeah. was. I don't know if it if it was irony. It was more just. I don't know me wanting to to interact with this character or, to, or sort of use this character. But then do you have another Instagram account that you love? Or do you have a love-hate relationship with Instagram? No, yeah, I, I only... Because I do, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I only use it for this, for this project. So I, I started the account, you know, three months before the show, and then it ended with the opening of the show. And uh -huh. I kind of took a break from it, and now I'm sort of rethinking my next, like, approach towards it. I mean, it. I'm struck by the fact that all of you seem to use it primarily within your work but not so much in your personal life. Dan, I don't know if that's true, you might be different. Uh, I use it primarily for my dog. It's exceptionally <laughs> cute. Um, but I was gonna say also, I mean, we're talking about Instagram a lot because it's the most visual. Twitter is primarily a news platform and a breaking news platform to some extent. Uh, but we use Pinterest a lot too because it's also highly visual. And there's a whole series of analytics and understanding when you allow people to create kind of their own curations and their own kind of pin boards on Pinterest, you're able to essentially look into their closet or their things and see which brands they associate with other brands. And you're able to understand kind of how they pattern match the world. And I think that there are kind of luxury brands and non-luxury brands that find themselves associated that wouldn't have understood that they were associated previously. So I hate to be so tactical, but there's a lot of analytics and a lot of really interesting things you can learn when you get those views into people's lives. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.